So the sad reality is that we have all chosen to stick our heads in the sand. Western civilization, Western culture, from Europe to the Middle East, oh, that's not part of the West, from Europe to this country, we have not stood up for free speech. We have not stood up against the enemies of free speech. We have not taken a firm stand for one of the most fundamental principles on which Western civilization is grounded. In Europe, there are, there are laws upon laws upon laws that restrict speech in a variety of different ways. Charlie Edbo, and I assume you all know the story of Charlie Edbo, before the Muslims ever slaughtered anybody there, it was the French government that was harassing them and trying to stop them and trying to silence them from speaking their minds. We see the same kind of phenomena on American campuses. Campuses, universities, the places where you're supposed to open your mind and hear all kinds of points of view. Do you know they have free speech zones on university? Little areas where you actually can talk. So this very fundamental principle is under attack. And, and again, we truly have chosen to stick our head in the sand. And I think to a large extent, there are two things going on here. One is, I think we take it for granted, particularly in America. We take free speech for granted. It's in the Constitution. It's that First Amendment thing. Yeah, the courts seem to protect it. Eh, everything's fine. And we don't think about it. We don't deal with it. In Europe, I fear to say, they never quite got it. One of the reasons there's real erosion in free speech in Europe is because they don't have a First Amendment. They don't have it in a constitution. They don't have it in a legal document that they can refer to. And I fear that if we didn't have a First Amendment, if we didn't have it in the Constitution, free speech would be eroding dramatically in this country as well, much faster than it is today. But the second, so one reason is, I think, complacency. We just got used to this, right? Second reason is, I don't know that we really understand it. Why is free speech important? Why is free speech so fundamental to what this country is about, to what Western civilization is about. And we're going to talk about Western civilization today. So I want to dig deep. I want to go to what free speech means and why it's important. I want to get away from just throwing it out there, but really do a little bit of history. So we're going to do a little history lesson. Right? Because free speech, in my view, is one of those fundamental concepts that makes Western civilization Western civilization. And I know it's not, it's not um, politically correct, another, by the way, attack on free speech, to talk about Western civilization as being special. But it is very special. It's in my view the greatest civilization we have ever had as human beings. It should be the shining city on the hill that the rest of the world look up to and adapts to and embraces. Western civilization is what makes possible the wealth, the freedom, the prosperity, the intellectual freedom that we have all over the West. And by the way, when I say the West, Anybody who adopts the ideas of Western civilization is the West. In some ways, you see more of Western civilization in the East, in Asia, than you are in the West. As Europe is abandoning it, Asia is picking it up. So let's take a step back. What is Western civilization? What are the core principles of Western civilization? What makes Western civilization Western? When did it all begin? How far back does Western civilization go? What's that? 
Yeah, Aristotle. So people, people here have uh, cheating. <laughs> They've heard me before. It's Aristotle, but Aristotle was in Greece, and Aristotle was a long time ago, and after Aristotle, he was forgotten. And there was no Western civilization for a long, long time. Western civilization is a modern phenomenon. Western civilization is a phenomenon of the last 300 years. And I hope you like history, because we're going to do a little bit of history. Western civilization is a phenomenon of a period that happened to have happened in Western Europe, and that's why it's called the West, in the 18th century. It is the rise of one single crucial idea of Aristotle's, the rediscovery of that idea, the embrace of that idea, the acceptance of that idea throughout a culture. And that idea is the importance of reason, the significance of reason. Indeed, we call this age, this age that starts at the end of the 17th century and goes into deep into the 18th century, we call it what? The age of reason. We call it enlightenment. Right? From light. From being enlightened by reason. And the first figure of this age of reason is not a philosopher, but a scientist. It's Newton. Because what does Newton tell us? What does Newton teach us? He teaches us that science explains the world. That we can know reality through use of our mind, through reason. And what is he combating? What is this against? Against the church, against religion. The idea that knowledge is derived from mystical revelation. That we can't know reality through science. Indeed, this is not long after the church puts Galileo under house arrest because they don't like the idea that the earth goes around the sun. The sun is supposed to go around the earth. That's what it says. This is following a period in Western history where people are burnt at the stake for being scientists. People are burnt at the stake in the West for being apostates. People are burnt at the stake in the West for heresy. The Enlightenment comes after a period of darkness, the Dark Ages. Now, there's stuff in between, but that's a general idea. So this is a time, the, the Enlightenment is a time where people still remember, still know about religious persecution. And they know that people are being persecuted for the ideas that they held. And yet, what is Newton doing? Newton is, is challenging everything we believe to that point. He's discovering laws of reality, laws of physics, that actually explain what's going on. And he doesn't need mystical revelation for this. Just science. 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 And then you get philosophers like Locke, who take this scientific method, who take this idea of reason, and apply it to politics. And one of the things they discover, right, when you start thinking about this... Before the Enlightenment, before the Enlightenment, we viewed human beings as members, of, primarily as members of groups. What tribe do you belong to? That was the primary way in which people were viewed. The group you belong to. What John Locke and the Enlightenment figures understand is, once you get the idea of reason, the importance, the efficacy of reason, who reasons? The group's reason? Do we have a collective consciousness up here that's thinking together? If there is one, I'm not participating. You didn't invite me in. No, only individuals reason. Only individuals can think. Right? Even in group think sessions, you know group think sessions, you get around, you kind of brainstorm and stuff. Everybody has to do their own thinking. Everybody has to think for themselves. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Even brainstorming doesn't work. There's no collective consciousness. There is no such thing as the group, the tribe, the public. All there is are individuals. So this is the second concept that Western civilization gets, that the Enlightenment gives us. Reason, individualism. 
The unit of importance politically and morally is the individual, not the group. No accident. John Locke comes up with the concept of, which the founding fathers later referred to, right, of individual rights, not responsibilities. Rights, individual rights, which means what? What do individual rights mean? What do rights mean? Stuff you get? Well, whoever gives them, what do they mean? They mean freedom. When you say, I have a right to my life, it means I have a right to live my life as I see fit, free of, we talked about freedom, right? What does free mean? Free of what? Control, coercion, force. So the whole idea of rights is that you as an individual, your life belongs to you, not to the tribe, not to the group, it belongs to you. And you have the freedom to live your life as you see fit. As you see fit. That's the whole idea of individual rights. You have a right to life, liberty. Liberty is the, is the idea that you are free to think and to act on your thoughts as you see fit. And you have a right to pursue happiness. To act for the attainment of your own happiness. That's what rights mean. So the whole Western project, if you will, Western civilization project, is about these two concepts. It's about these two ideas. Reason and individualism. Now, how is this connected to free speech? Well, free speech is the manifestation of that in reality. It's not about just thinking thoughts up here. It's the ability to express them. It's the ability to go out and try to change the world based on your ideas. It's the ability to write about them, to publish them, to paint them, to draw them, to express yourself, to take those ideas and act on them. That's what freedom means. That's what rights mean. They mean freedom. And the Enlightenment, they understand that this is crucial. This is at the heart of it because they've just experienced this hundreds of years where you couldn't think, where you weren't allowed to express yourself, where you couldn't publish books that were counter to the prevailing wisdom, where you weren't treated as an individual, where you weren't treated as your life belonged to you. It belonged to fill in the blank. So they understood how crucial it is if reason is that important to human life then we need to be not just to be able to think but to act on those thoughts which means to speak to write to publish now why is reason so important i do this exercise you know how do, how do we as human beings survive how do we thrive how do we create all the values around us How's, all the stuff up here on the stage the chairs that you sit on the clothes that you wear all products of what? Because as a, as a biological species, just as a physical species, we're pretty pathetic. Just look around the room. <laughs> we're weak. We're slow. We have no claws. We have no fangs. Right? You tried running down a bison, biting into it. But, but I, for example, have plans on a bison burger later tonight. So how do we get a bison burger if we can't run down the bison? It's all here. We build weapons. We build tools. We figure stuff out. We have strategies for hunting. We build buildings. We build skyscrapers. We build computers. All of them a product of human reason. Reason is at the core of what it means to be human. Reason is our means by which we survive, by which we thrive, by which we flourish. To defend, to talk about speech is to talk about reason. Thinking is meaningless unless you can apply it. And what kind of speech? Look, if we all agree all the time, and I'm sure you have friends that you agree pretty much on everything, then you don't need the protection of a right to free speech. Because what does it mean to be protected? It means that I can't come 
punch you because I disagree with you. It means they can't put tape on your mouth to shut you up. I can't stop you physically from saying what you believe. But if we all agree, it doesn't matter. Have a law, don't have a law, what difference does it make? We all agree. The idea of free speech, the idea that we need protection to be able to speak is so that we can offend. Yeah, so that we can disagree. Because you know what? Every new idea in human history offended somebody. You should, you know, you probably all know that Darwin offended a lot of people, right? But Newton offended a lot of people. Galileo offended a lot of people. Locke, John Locke offended huge numbers of people. The founding fathers offended the king of England. And a lot of fellow Americans who didn't want to join in the revolution, they were offended by what the founding fathers did. Every new idea, every important idea, every truth discovered is offensive to somebody. If you don't offend people, you're not working. You're not thinking. You're not trying new things. You're not pushing the envelope. And again, this idea comes from a time in which the thinkers of the Enlightenment were offensive. Voltaire, famous French Enlightenment figure, right, was very critical of the church, very critical of religion. And he indeed had to escape Paris. Paris. Paris always somehow figures into these things. Because he was being persecuted. He was going to be killed. He had to go to Amsterdam, which was then a beacon of, of religious tolerance, to be able to write. The figures of the Enlightenment were offending people all around them. And again, our founders. You know, Thomas Jefferson has something called the Jefferson Bible. We took the New Testament. And he took a pair of scissors, and he cut out the piece, parts he liked, and cut out the parts he didn't like, and, and created what he called the Jefferson Bible. I'm sure that people in this room were offended by that. Suddenly, in its time, people were offended by it. But Thomas Jefferson did it, because he thought that was true. It thought there were good parts, and there were not so good parts in the Bible. And he had, he understood, certainly more than almost anybody else in human history, Thomas Jefferson understood, how important it was to have that right, to have that ability to do that, to offend, to disagree, sometimes in bad taste, sometimes in an offensive way. I forgot to ask, where's my clicker? Oh, it's all, so just advance the slide. So I'm going uh, to show some cartoons. And some of them are offensive, but that's okay. These are the cartoons, by the way, for which Charlie Hedbo was slaughtered. These are their cartoons. This is why they were killed. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it says. It's French, exactly. You know. That's offensive in and of itself. Right? <laughs> so the whole idea of free speech is that it allows makes possible, it defends offensive speech. And some of it is crude, and some of it we don't like, but that's what it means. And this is the point. Let's say 90% of this offensive speech is really stupid, right? It's just dumb. It's just, well, why would you even do that, right? It doesn't really discover anything. And 10% are these beautiful gems that are of truth, right? Then let's ban the 90% and just keep the 10, right? But who gets to the side? The people in power? Well, they don't want the truth that they believe in challenged. So anything that's they are the university professors, the public by vote, well, majorities are almost always wrong. Have been in human history many, many, many times. The only way, again, what the founders of our civilization understood was, we've got to allow all this speech, some of it unbelievably stupid. I mean, half the episodes of South Park are disgusting. 
I won't, I, you know, I can't watch them. But then once in a while, there's a gem like that. that. That whole episode is brilliant, right? It makes it all worth it, right? Who gets to decide? So if we believe in truth, if we believe in reason, if we, if we want better, improved, if we want to progress, then we have to allow speech, whether we individually like it or not. You can turn your back. You don't have to look at it. You can boycott it. But you don't have a right to silence it. You don't have a right to pull a gun and destroy it. Now, what the founders understood is that's great that we all believe this and we all uphold this and we all think it's good. But there are always going to be bad guys, like these Muslim terrorists, who don't agree with us, who want to silence people, who want to pull out a gun and shoot people for what they say. And we need protection from those bad guys. And this is what we create a government for. The one reason, the only reason really, that we have a government is to protect us from bad guys. Arbitrate disputes, but that's it, basically. To protect our rights, our right to free speech. And one of the most horrific things that I think the the cartoon, the South Park cartoon illustrates, but even more so the behavior of our presidents in the last 30 years has demonstrated, is how our government won't, doesn't do it. That our government in modern times not only is not protecting our right to free speech, but is actually violating that right. So, and I'll give you a few examples of that. Free speech, core idea of Western civilization because reason and individualism are what Western civilization is. What's made the ability to live in Steamboat Springs, at the high standard of living you live here, the quality of life we all enjoy in the West is a product of reason and individualism. If you ask the Founding Fathers what they believed in, they would have said reason and individualism. Go to Jefferson Memorial and read what it says if you don't believe me. There's the quote there, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember exactly. Bring everything before reason, even the existence of God, needs to be brought before the evaluation of reason, according to Jefferson. And individualism, individual rights are right there in our Declaration, and we have a Bill of Rights in our Constitution. This idea of free speech is the application of the ideas of reason and individualism in the political realm, in the realm in which we live, in the role of government. Its job, one job, only job, is to protect that. So let's see how it's done. Let's see how well we've done in the last few decades. 1989, 1989, Salman Rushdie writes a book. Salman Rushdie is a Pakistani Muslim who wrote a book, uh, the name just slipped my mind, Satanic verses, thank you. Satanic verses. And a fatwa, a religious edict, a religious command, is issued by the supreme leader of Iran. Isn't that cool? Supreme leader? I've always wanted to be a supreme leader of something. <laughs> supreme leader. Um, supreme leader of Iran, uh, Tula Khomeini at the time, right? This is just before he died. And he issues a $1 million bounty on the head of an author. Now, this isn't some mullah or some, you know, nobody issuing a, a fatwa. This is the head of a state, of a country. This is like the President of the United States saying, I don't like what they're writing about me. I'm putting out a million dollar bounty on X. Right? Because in this case, the satanic verses had something negative to say about Islam. So there's a bounty on the head of Solomon Rushdie. He goes into hiding because this isn't a joke. People are trying to kill him. But it's not just on Solomon Rushdie. Solomon Rushdie, was, by the way, was living in England at the time. So not an American problem, you would justifiably say. But the fatwa included threats 
to the lives and property of the American publisher of the book and any bookstore in the United States that carried the book. And indeed, a bookstore in New York City that had satanic verses in this font was firebombed in 1989. Now, what was George Bush's response to this? A good Republican president, right? You know, basically, I've got the quote back there, but basically it was, we don't approve of this, of, of, uh, of writing stuff that's disparaging against religion. Look, you have a right to do it, and we should defend that right, but, but really, you know, who needs the stuff, negative stuff about religion to be out there? Head of state, a head of state of another state, just threatened American citizens, and the American government goes, eh, yeah, there's some justification for that. That's eh, a little too radical. That's not protecting free speech. That's not protecting free speech. The whole job of the American government is to protect us from people overseas trying to kill us. And all we can do is, eh. In 2006, a publication in Copenhagen, Denmark, published, when we flip, flip another cartoon. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting, but there are a bunch of them. Uh, published, uh, no, uh, go back to this, yeah. Published cartoons, these are some of them. Um, and you know why they published these cartoons? So they, they published the cartoons because there were rumors in Europe that you couldn't get anybody to actually draw Muhammad because they were scared. Museums were taking paintings of Muhammad off of the wall and putting it in the basement. Sculptures that had been stood there for hundreds of years were being taken down and put away so as not to offend Muslims. A woman wanted to do a series of little books for children on religious leaders in history. And one of them was going to be on Muhammad. And she needed somebody to draw. It's a children's book. You have drawings. Nobody would do the drawings. So the Danish publisher said, nobody's talking about this. Yet there's this self-censorship going on on a massive scale throughout Europe. Let's publish the cartoons and see what happens. So he went and he found 10 cartoonists who were brave enough to publish these cartoons. By the way, I'm not sure they would do it again. But in 2005, they were brave enough. And they published the cartoons. And in the beginning, nothing happened, which upset a lot of uh, Muslim leaders in Europe. So they started writing letters to Muslim leaders in the Middle East, pointing out the cartoons. And suddenly, about four months later, riots broke out in the Middle East. All over the Middle East. They burnt embassies, they murdered people, they destroyed property. All over the Middle East. They threatened Americans, they threatened Europeans, they threatened everybody. So what did we do? That's the South Park episode, right? That's the period. So what did we do? Well, George Bush, Jr. now, another one of my favorites, you can ask me uh, in the Q&A if you want. Came out and said, these cartoons are very offensive. We find these are cartoons offensive. Let me tell you something. It's none of the government's business. I don't care whether the President of the United States finds this cartoon or that cartoon offensive. That's not his job. His job is not as a literary critic or a cartoon critic or a decider of what religion makes sense and what religion doesn't make sense. That's what the separation of state from church means. It means government has no opinion about these things. His job is to defend my right to offend anybody I want and to be free from force inflicted on me. It's to defend the lives and property of Americans from barbarians who are trying to kill them. That's his job. That's it. No, but we did nothing. Nothing. We were encouraged. Everybody in the United States was encouraged not to publish those cartoons. Indeed, not a single major publication in the United States in 2006 published those cartoons. Even the Wall Street Journal, right of center, you would argue, would refuse to publish the Danish cartoons. Never mind the New York Times and everybody else. Remember that if everybody had published the cartoons, if everybody had said, we stand for the right to free speech, if everybody had done it, 
there would have not been a Charlie Hedbo massacre. Because who do you go after? If everybody, what do they declare war in the West? They're not quite there yet. Right? They can't kill us all. This is why, you remember the, the little speech in South Park? We should all publish the cartoons. Absolutely, we should all publish the cartoons. That's how we defend ourselves. That's how we protect ourselves. That's how we stand up to those bastards. But no, we were encouraged by the Bush administration not to do it. In the United States today, there are cartoonists who have published the cartoons of Muhammad, we can flip, flip more, um, who, uh, who are in hiding, fear for their own life. The U.S. government will not protect them. And I think maybe the worst of this, <laughs> not surprising, is this administration. Remember Benghazi? Remember the excuse they gave for why there was the whole thing in Benghazi where the ambassador was killed? It was a video on YouTube. Now put aside whether that's right or wrong. It doesn't matter for the, my purposes right now. A video on YouTube inflamed Muslims to kill Americans. So what would you do if you were commander in chief? I'd put, yeah, was it turning a glass? <laughs> well, not, maybe not quite as dramatic, but I'd put the Air Force in the air and go after the bastards. No, what the Obama administration did is called Google and asked that they take the video down. Now, when the White House calls you, that's not a request. It's George Washington n noted, government is force. Government is a gun. When government says, please do this, you do it. Google gets a phone call in the freest country in the world, in the country that's supposed to stand for the First Amendment. Google gets a phone call to take down a video because some Muslims around the world found it offensive? Talk about defeat. Talk about giving in. Talk about surrender. There was this uh, uh, really horrible um, uh, preacher in Florida. I can't remember his name. But he wanted to burn the Quran. You remember this? There's this whole thing. And Obama was interviewed it, uh, about it. And he basically says, I'd love to stop him. I just don't have any laws that allow me to do that. If only you gave me the power, I would shut him up. Now, that's scary. It's scary. And again, it's not, I don't think it's unique to Obama. Bush and Bush have been as weak, and I'm sure there's a Clinton story in there somewhere, as weak about this stuff as anybody. No. Freedom of speech means we can offend Muslims. We can offend Christians. And of course, note that the government actually funds exhibits that offend Christians, right? That, that, that Jesus in a urinal or whatever, right? The government funds that, never mind getting offended by it. So somehow, we only can offend Muslims. We can't offend Christians or Jews. I'm offended every day by Salon.com because they attack Ayn Rand in horrible ways. Ayn Rand's my hero. It offends me. So what, am I going to go shoot up Salon.com? I mean, we're all offended all the time. It's because we're thinking. And some ideas are offensive, are horrible. Some people do really bad stuff when they speak and write. But you don't have a right to silence them. You don't have a right to shoot them. And the government's job is to protect us. But Muslims are special. We've carved that out. So our government doesn't protect free speech. It doesn't protect us anymore. And indeed, as we see with codes on campuses, speech codes on campuses, but more than that, they are, they are law professors today. For the first time in American history, they are prestigious law professors who are writing articles in prestigious journals arguing that free speech is overrated. That it's, it's not fair because some people have more of it than others because some people express themselves more than others. So they want to equal it by silencing some points of view in order to give what they call space for other points of view. This is the trend. This is Because when university professors start talking about something, like 10 years later, more professors have joined, and 20 years later, politicians are talking about it, and 30 years later, we've all just accepted it as if it was always true. 
That's the power of professors. I believe universities are the most important places on the planet. The most powerful people in the world are professors. Because they think for a living, or not, as the case may be, and they educate our kids, and they write the books, and they write the articles in the magazines and the newspapers. They influence the culture in ways that nobody else does. And politicians, and the media, and everybody else we blame for, they're just products of their schooling, of their professors, of these so-called experts out there. So freedom of speech in America is under attack. In Europe, it doesn't exist anymore, really, because you know what the, the first law that was passed in modern Europe that violated the idea of free speech? It was one of these laws that we would all say, well, yeah, that, that's reasonable, right? Because it was, it was banned speech that everybody here agrees would be offensive. So in Germany and in France, basically for the last 50 years, it's been illegal to advocate for Holocaust denial. If you write that you deny the Holocaust, if you say that you deny the Holocaust, you go to jail. Now, I find Holocaust deniers unbelievably offensive, horrible, stupid, irrational, immoral, everything. You know what? They have a right to say it. And once you, but once you put them in jail, who's next? What other? Now, if you deny the, 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 the massacre of Albanians or uh, Armenians by the Turks, you can go to jail. And if you offend Muslims in some countries, you can go to jail. In, in Sweden, paradise, to many on the left, Sweden, an artist last year went to jail for six months for painting a painting. Now it was a stupid painting, an offensive painting, a horrible, some neo-fascist painting. But it was a painting. He went to jail for six months in Sweden. So free speech is slipping away from us. And when free speech slips away from us, the discovery of new ideas slip away from us. When offensive speech is silenced, I'm going to be one of the first people to be silent. Those of you who heard my other speeches, some of them are pretty offensive <laughs> to some people. It's not, I take that really seriously. If, we're going to, if you want to change the world in any way, it means that the world is not the way you would like it. It means that by changing it, you're going to upset some people. You know, Uber really offends taxi drivers. Every new idea is offensive to somebody. Once we start picking winners and losers in the realm of ideas, it's one thing to do in economics. Bad enough when we do it in this realm of economics. But when we start doing it in the realm of ideas, we are dead as a culture. We're dead as a civilization. If there's one issue, that we need to unite around, even if we disagree about other ideas. There's one issue we need to rally around to defend. It is free speech. <laughs> Give me some, flip, the, flip some more of these. Go one more. One more. Let's see if we can find it. That one. Now, this was painted, this was drawn by a friend of mine who was born Muslim. Uh, it's an Albanian family. And he knows. Right? He knows the culture. He's an apostate. He's the first guy to have his head chopped off if they have an opportunity. He's on the list. But he draws, and he puts his name on it. And if we want to win this, if we really want to win this, then we have to be as brave as he is. We have to stand up. We have to be willing to be counted. We have to publish. We have to say. We have to speak. We have to defend people's right to speak, to publish, to say. And, and the best thing with the cartoons is publish them. After Charlie Edbo, I, we took at the Institute all the cartoons that they published, put it up on Twitter, and said, tweet them. Right? If you say, just sweet Charlie, right? and you won't publish the cartoons, then you're lying. You're not Charlie. Charlie's about publishing the cartoons in spite of the fear. Charlie was about publishing cartoons because they offended Muslims. Because you know what? They deserve to be offended if this is how they react. If they go out burning embassies, if they're shooting people in the streets, if they're walking into newspapers and gunning people down, then they deserve to be offended. 
and we need to offend them more, not less. Now, if you're interested in why we treat Muslims with kid gloves and nobody else, I mean, one reason is fear, but there's a deeper reason. Ask me in the Q&A. So we can't stay quiet. You know Muhammad Adda. You know where this is from. This is from what he said on one of the planes. You know, everything will be fine. Right? Just don't say anything. And that's what they want us to believe. They want us. They want us to bury our heads in the sand. Thank you all. Do we have some uh, questions? We'll start with Chuck. Go forward on the, on the trying to remember what's on. Oh, okay. Bonsoir, mon ami. Comment allez-vous? I don't speak French. I don't either. Um, I just thought I, this is a controversial question, sir, so I thought I'd start out with a controversial language. Um, in the past week, uh, there on a college campus in the United States, some college students did something that was abhorrent to me and probably everybody in this room. They did it on a bus. They did a chant that was, again, abhorrent. But it was speech. And I guess my question to you, and by the way, the president of the university eviscerated these kids and then expelled them and then tore the name down and then boarded up the, the <laughs> building where they lived where kids who didn't do anything wrong lived. I guess my question to you, sir, is uh, clearly that's abhorrent, but was it not? What, was it free speech? Was it part of this 90% you described? So look, it's free speech. They have a right to be racist. They have a right to say it. It's abhorrent. It's horrible. They have a right to it. But the question is, as an institution, whether, imagine it was a private university. Put aside that it's a public university. As an institution, you also have a right to say what's acceptable in your campus and what's not. And there's probably a code of behavior that students sign when they get admitted to the university. And, you know, and it's the job of the president of the university to abide by that. So if, and I don't know the details here, but if this was a clear violation of that statement, then, it's, then maybe what he did was appropriate. Now, it's tricky because it's a public university, right? It is tricky. And there's certain behaviors, but even there, that we would not, that we just don't accept. But it, it gets very challenging when we have public property, when we have public spaces, because exactly that issue. What, you know, you've got, supposedly the university is a pub, public space which respects free speech. But you can also, we can also agree that different institutions are going to write up their codes of conduct within that institution. I think the codes of conduct today in the United States at universities are ridiculous. The codes of speech are absurd. Uh, you know, put aside this clearly ridiculous, you know, horrific um, racial uh, attack. But, but today you can't say, I mean, the things that you can't say that we would find laughable uh, that you could get penalized on campus for. No, free, well, it isn't, but, but let's understand what free speech means. Free speech doesn't mean that you can come onto my property and say whatever the hell you want, right? I get to set the rules on my property, what you say. Or if I own a radio station, I get to decide what's said on my radio station, right? Free speech says that on your radio station, you can say whatever you want and nobody can shut you down, but not on mine. So if somebody establishes a university and says, look, here are the rules, here are the principles, you can't do X, Y, Z. It's their way. You don't have to join the university. You don't have to go to that university if, if you don't agree with it. Right? So the challenge is when it's public. Because public is supposed to be, and this is, this is the challenge of having public anything. I'm not a big fan of public. Okay. Privatize them all. Back here. My name's Mike. A lot of us gave up on the newspapers um, a while ago. I think we all can agree the internet is the best place for free speech currently. Uh, my question is directed towards the Federal Communications Commission's decision recently to uphold net neutrality. And specifically, I would like you to comment regarding the supporters of net neutrality claiming free speech 
as their primary reason for doing so. Good question. I mean, look, what, what net neutrality really is, is the government takeover of the internet. It, it's, taken the author, it's taken over the authority to now regulate every aspect of the internet. Now, it's also said there's certain things we're not going to do for now. For example, we're not going to regulate speech on the internet for now. But by using Title IV, whatever it's called, Title II, sorry, Title II of, the, of a Telecommunication Act that was written in the 1930s, um, they now have the authority to step in and decide what can and cannot be published on the internet. And that is just horrific. That is, I mean, the whole idea. I mean, remember the last time we used Title II? We got AT&T. Who the hell wants to go back to the days of eight? I mean, you don't remember those days. Some of us do. You remember long distance charges? You remember that? Before MCI, before Sprint competed with them, and before the breakup of, I mean, it's horrific, right? So they're going to use that now to create what? This monolithic internet? Now, what was the argument on the flip side in defense of free speech? So this whole came about because some companies were buying more access. So um, Netflix, for example, bought the right to deliver movies to your home faster than, let's say, Google was delivering stuff to you. Because Netflix was delivering movies and they needed stable, consistent, high-speed bandwidth to you. Google, when you do a search, if it's a little slower, sometimes a little faster, no big deal. Right? So Netflix paid contractually with the people who actually own the cables, own the fiber, to do this. Nobody's free speech is being violated there. Right? But what are the advocates saying? That's not equal. Right? We want equal access. So we want to trim back on Netflix and allow Google, in this case, more. But that's, again, that's the same as saying on my radio show that if I have a bunch of Ayn Rand fans speaking, oh, no, 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 wait a minute, that's not fair. What about a leftist position? What about a middle-of-the-road position, a conservative position, a wacky anarchist position? What about the whole gamut of positions? So I don't get to decide what's on my... People should be able to decide if it's their fiber, if it's their cables. They should be able to decide what runs through that cable, and how much to charge, and under what terms to charge it. But yeah, I, I mean, I believe that this is the beginning of a massive assault by the government on the internet. And, and it's very, very scary because the internet is, to a large extent, the last bastion where we really have, I mean, you can find anything, nutty <laughs> and legitimate. The whole gamut is on there, and you get to choose. Isn't that beautiful? that you get to choose. Nobody gets to choose for you. Wonderful and scary at the same time. Yep. Uh, my name's Lewis. Um, I have a, a couple, couple things. It seems to me there are some places where you may not want free speech. For example, you were in the Israeli military. Now, if uh, you get an order to attack some position, and uh, the soldiers say, oh, no, I don't know if I want to do that. And these other guys, you know, let's, uh, let's talk about this. I don't think the, uh, the army, you know, in, the, in my example, the Israeli army would have approved of your speaking up against that uh, possibility. And uh, uh, I have two, two more things. So my question is, when, you were, in, when you were in the Israeli army, did you speak up against the orders of your commanders and, and feel that was the right thing to do, if you did. Oh, sure I did, of course. I mean, any good army encourages its soldiers to speak up against, but then you have to follow the orders. That's the deal that you got. Now, look, in my view, free speech is absolute. But when you go into the army, now Israel's, Israel's diff different because it's a draft. I'm against the draft. I'm against the draft even in Israel. So. A volunteer army. When you sign up to go into the army, you sign a document that says these are the conditions by which this is a trade. I'm giving up certain things in order to be able to do certain things for a specific period of time. I'm not becoming your slave, but I'm giving up the ability to say whatever I feel like whenever I want. And it's not just that. I'm giving up the ability to wake up whenever I want in the morning. I mean, one of the things I hated about the Israeli army is they wanted me up at 5 a.m. every morning. The bastards, right? <laughs> so that's part of the deal. That's part of the exchange. Again, free speech is not, 
is not mean that you can do whatever the hell you want under any circumstances, any way you want. But it does mean that when you own a newspaper, you can publish anything you want in that newspaper. It does mean that when you're in a radio station, you could say, it does mean that I can stand up here and say anything I want. Right? The, the organizers are the only people who have a right to pull me off the stage. The police doesn't. That's the difference. Right? If I offend Obama, he does not have a right to send the FBI here to pull me off the stage. The organizers, because it's their event, do, because I have a contract with them. The contract says, I speak under these conditions. I didn't sign it, by the way. Uh, under these conditions. <laughs> and you have a right to do X, Y, Z. So within all that context, it's, an absolute, it's still an absolute right. But it doesn't mean you have a right to other people's property. Like, that. you know, you can do whatever you want in the army. Or at work. What about your employees that decide in the middle of the day that they're going to sing? Right? That's free speech. But it's on your property, and you have a contract with them on, on the terms of employment. They can't do that. Okay, he's got a question. Okay. I don't need it. They're recording. We, we oh, okay. That's why they need it. Okay. All right. You were championing academia as some of the most important people. Yeah. But I sense that science is now being marginalized by those who are in consensus. Take climate change, for example. Yeah. And it's becoming, it's not just whether science or climate, but academia seems to squelch, in many cases, dissension. Oh. And, and, and to deny climate change now is almost a crime. It's called climate change denial. And why denial. is it called that? To give you the association in your mind with what? Holocaust denial. That's the reason they use that word. But let, you misunderstood what I said about academia. I was not praising academia. <laughs> I was emphasizing its importance. I was saying what academia does sets the tone for the culture for the future. Academia, I have to be nice because I'm going tomorrow to UC um, Boulder. I don't know. I don't know how to be nice. Is a dead... <laughs> It's, 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 it's the malicious cancer of our culture. The ideas that are preached there, the behavior that is encouraged there, is killing America. My point is, they're killing America. And it's, gonna, it's manifest in our media, and in our politics, and in our culture. All I said was, it starts there. They're the most powerful people. That doesn't mean they're good. They're bad. Academia today is really bad. You can't be out, out, an outlier. There, there's no real academic freedom. Academic freedom is what? Academic freedom means that you agree with the majority. As long as you agree with the majority, you have academic freedom. If you're an outlier, you, you know, they silence you. And they, and they have a great technique to silence you. What's that? It's called tenure. Right? It's a club. And who gets to decide who gets to join the club? The people who already are in the club. They do. They do that all the time. I, mean, I agree with you. And I'm saying that's unbelievably scary, and that bodes really, really bad for the future of this country. They are not a bastion of free speech anymore. They are the opposite. They're destroying free speech in universities, and that means that free speech will be destroyed in our culture in the years to come. I'm Tom Willman. Uh, in my short 64 years, I have witnessed a lot of peculiar things happening to this country. Um, certainly all of us could agree that if a person screams fire in the middle of the woods, it may not mean anything. If you do it in a movie theater, it's not free speech, it's endangerment. Would you speak to the political correctness phenomenon that has happened in this country and why it's happened? and why the collective is so obsessed with it? Yeah, let me just say something about the fire thing, because there's a lot, of, a lot of misunderstanding here about what the screaming fire in a crowded theater means, right? People say, oh, you see, that's a restriction of free speech. No! It's a property rights issue. When you walk into a theater, there's an implicit contract that you're gonna, not going to cause everybody to run out for no reason, right? So you're violating the contract that you have with the, with the property owner who's 
invited you into their home to watch a movie. It has nothing to do with speech. It, it, it again goes to this property rights issue. You can't come into my house and say whatever the hell you want. I get to kick you out. You can't come to my house and yell fire when there's no fire. I'm going to really not like you if you do that. Right? Um, political correctness is a, is a, it's, it's a voluntary mechanism initially, right? It's, it's a way of shunning people who say certain things that you don't like. Uh, but what's happened is that the amount of stuff that now is politically incorrect to say is expanding and expanding and expanding. And it's getting the force of authority from universities, many of those universities, public universities, public institutions which are supposed to be open for free speech. And the universe of what's acceptable to say today on campuses is, is shrinking. And it's not just campuses. You're seeing this in the workplace. There's certain things in the workplace you can't say. I mean, I won't tell a female employee of mine that she's wearing a pretty dress. <laughs> right? I mean, you'd be, you could, I know, I think it's a shame. Right? It's a pretty dress, it's a pretty dress. Right? It's not sexual harassment. But today you can't say it. And the courts will uphold it, which means the force of government is behind it. It's more than just a workplace thing. It's the force of government. It's, you know, workplace harassment. So we've taken that political correctness and instituted it to a large extent into law, particularly employment law. And again, this is slow erosion of this idea of free speech. It's expanding, taking the political correctness where we just say, oh, we don't want to hear racism. So in my company, racists are out. And then, then it becomes more and more and more. Yep. That one I haven't heard, but OK. Ann Lowe, and I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned earlier, why is it so hard to criticize um, Muslims, and how does um, all this topic relate to foreign policy? <laughs> you, got a, you got a half an hour? <laughs> so, so let's start with why in our culture um, we can't criticize Muslims, you can't criticize Islam. Um, I mean, I think there are two things going on here. One is certainly, there's a certain level of fear. And, and I think there should be a level of fear. I mean, they come with guns and machetes and they do horrible things to people. And people are afraid. But it's more than that to do with this political correctness. There's certain groups that we don't criticize, that we don't say anything negative about. And it has to do with, with, a, with a certain moral view that we have. Um, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example uh, from, from the Middle East. In, um, before 1967, before 1967, Europe loved Israel. They loved Israel, right? They, they sold Israel arms. Do you know that the United States had an arms embargo on Israel from 1948 until 1967? Not a single American weapon was sold to Israel between 48 and 67. So when Israel fought wars, they fought it with French airplanes, British tanks, German weapons, because the Europeans loved the Israelis. Now, why did they love the Israelis? Why did they love the Jews? They came from Europe. They stole from Europe, and they hate them now. Why did they love the Israelis? Because they were poor, pathetic, and miserable because they just survived the Holocaust, because they went to this desert, there was nothing there, because we love, you know, we, we, we morally feel obliged to have positive feelings towards the meek. The meek shall inherit the earth, right? Towards those who are doing badly, those who are struggling, those who are primitive, those who are behind. And we loved Israel because they were poor, pathetic Jews. What happened in 67? Those poor, pathetic Jews turned out to be, they turned out to kick ass, absolutely. Six days, they destroyed five Arab armies. In six days. One of the most astounding military victories ever. And they did it confidently. These were proud Jews. These were capable Jews. These were strong Jews. We don't like them anymore. Absolutely. Six-day war flipped Europe. 
France imposed an arms embargo on, the, on Israel immediately afterwards. Britain, everybody else. The only people then liked Israel are Americans, because we're, we're different, or used to be anyway. Who did they, but they need to love somebody. So they look to the Middle East and they say, we need some, somebody who's miserable and pathetic and, and a little off. Right? Palestinians, there they are. We love them. We love them. This is this whole ethic that we're brought up with, you know, of, 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 of somebody's need is a moral claim against us. If somebody's poor, if somebody's suffering, if somebody's miserable, if somebody's not quite right, we have to help them out. It's a claim against us. We have to pour our love towards them. We have to pour our money towards them. This is the whole basis of the welfare state. The whole basis of all this stuff is a morality that says that your need is a claim against me. I have to help you. That's what the morally right thing to do. And these Israelis, they're strong, they're powerful, and we don't trust them anymore. We don't trust strength. We don't trust big business. We don't trust billionaires, particularly today. We don't trust rich people. We don't trust successful people. But we love failure. And bail them out, and we redistribute our wealth towards them, and we vote to raise our own taxes so we can give them even more. This is the scourge of altruism, absolutely. The morality of altruism, the moral code that says that your life, your moral responsibility in life is towards others, not to make your life the best life that it can be. So instinctually, we always go for, for, for that. And if you, look at, if you look at the Muslim world, it's the poorest place on the planet. They behave like barbarians. They're pathetic, they're miserable. We can't criticize them. And we can't uphold, we can't hold them to high standards because that's just the way they are, which is racist, by the way, right? So Israel, God forbid, trying not to kill anybody happens to kill a few civilians. Oh my God, war crimes, let's hang them all, right? Palestinians can blow up school buses, they can murder Israeli children, they can do, they can chop people's heads off, they can do the most atrocious things in the world. And we say, oh, poor Palestinians, if only we didn't have checkpoints. Checkpoints, that's why they chop people's heads off. I mean, it's unbelievable, the double standard that we have in the Middle East. Because of this altruistic, because of this, their lives are more important than our lives, we can't support the confident, the strong, the able, the successful. So you get this un unbelievable double standard. And you see it all over the Middle East. You see it particularly with the Israelis. Because Israel is a civilized country. I mean, it's a symbol of civilization in the Middle East. I could be better. I'm the biggest critic in the world of Israel. But in comparison to anybody else in the Middle East, they're like heaven. And yet, all the criticism is towards them. All the criticisms that they're held to a higher standard than anybody in the world. Why? Because they're so good. We resent goodness and we adore badness. They can't help it. I mean, what a racist thing to say. Right? What, why can't they help it? <laughs> so I think that's why we treat Muslims with kid gloves, because, the, you know, they're down there. They're, you know. We don't want to oppress the oppressed. They're already oppressed. We can't criticize people who are oppressed. That's bad. Um, what should be done in the Middle East? So was that the next, the follow-up question? I just was asking you about foreign policy. Um, Okay, so this is my view of foreign policy. It's, it's, it's hard to do quickly. But let me say this. We don't have a foreign policy. The United States doesn't have a foreign policy. It hasn't had a foreign policy probably since World War II. We have no clue what we're doing in the world. We're, we're, we're like a blind man, you know, putzing around. It's worse than a blind man because we help our enemies and we suppress our friends. And it's, it's horrible. And it's not just Obama. It was Bush. It was everybody. Let me go back to the principle. The, the government has only one job, in my view, and that is to protect the lives and property of Americans. You mess with the lives and property of Americans, you get hellfire brought down on your head. You don't screw with Americans. That's foreign policy. Right? You blow up buildings in the United States, you are crushed and destroyed. And what I mean you is, I mean the people responsible, not you know, not Saddam Hussein, not bringing democracy to the Middle East, 
not building them sewers and schools, but figuring out who's really responsible. And you know what? All the terrorism in all that region, there are only two countries responsible for all of it, and we haven't attacked either one of them. Actually, one of them is our best friend. All the terrorism in the Middle East is funded by only two countries. I mean, in an important way. Iran funds all the Shiite terrorism and some Sunni, because they fund Hamas. And Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. ISIS got its start with Saudi money. Al-Qaeda with Saudi money. Maybe it's not the royal family. Maybe it's the cousins just below. <laughs> or the charities. Maybe it's not the government officially. But it's all Saudi money. Who builds the mosques all over the world? The Saudis and the Iranians. You want to end this? It's easy. It's easy. We put up four-page ads in the New York Times and the Washington Post right after 9-11 because the Wall Street Journal wouldn't carry the ad. They found it offensive. And we said there were only two countries that matter in the Middle East. Forget Afghanistan. Forget Iraq. Iran, Saudi Arabia. You take those regimes out and it ends. And all you're seeing is those two regimes back 15 years later, and here we are again 14 years later, all back again. It's all the same thing, same stuff. Because if you understand who the enemy is in the Middle East, it's not terrorism, war against terrorism. I mean, I hated Bush from 9-12. Because that's like FDR after F, uh, Pearl Harbor uh, 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 declaring war on kamikaze pilots. Terrorism is a tactic. Terrorism is not the enemy. The enemy are Islamic totalitarians, jihadists, whatever you want to call them. I don't care. That's the enemy. And then you say, who, which regime? What's the difference between Saudi Arabia and ISIS? What's the difference between the two? Anybody know? Both chop people's heads off. Saudis chop people's heads off for certain offenses. Both stone women for adultery. Bo uh, I think ISIS actually lets women drive. Saudis won't even do that. What, what's the difference? The, the, the only difference is that the ISIS wants, I forget the guy's name, to rule, and Saudis want the Saud family to rule. That's the difference. They, they've got some different interpretation of, of the, the, the apocalypse that's coming. But other than that, there's no difference. This is the same ideology. This is the enemy. And unless you're willing to call that the enemy, you can't win. Because you can't fight terrorism. You can only fight countries and ideologies and you have to be able to say Islam is responsible not all Muslims but the people who interpret Islam in this radical way they're responsible this radical Islamist ideology that's responsible it's not extremism and remember you, you can make fun of Obama all you want right but Bush never did it Bush ne for one week he called them Islamo fascists and then he stopped one week nobody's used the word Islam to, 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 to address the terrorists, uh, you know, in a position of authority in the United States. So my foreign policy is defend America. Again, I don't believe in bases all over the world. I don't believe we should be in Africa. Uh, you know, we, we have troops in 100 countries. You don't, you don't defend the, the rights of Americans, the lives and property of Americans. You don't have to be in 100 countries. You, you probably don't have to be in many countries at all. You just have to go kill the bad guys and come home. And kill them in such a way that they will never dare touch a hair on an American again. The only thing that will stop them is fear. Fear of you know, Allah. Through us. Shall we continue this conversation over at Ghost Ranch at our party? Sounds good. Okay. Let's have a hand for Yaron Brook. Thank you. <laughs>